Today, we have Lamar Johnson, Executive Director of the Center for Customer Insight and Marketing Solutions, as well as the Senior Associate Director of the Supply Chain Management Center of Excellence here at the Macomb School of Business, interviewing Larry Young, Chief Executive Officer and President of Dr. Pepper Snapple. We will begin tonight with the Q&A between Mr. Young and Mr. Johnson, and then we will open the floor to Q&A from the audience. As a reminder, today's event will end promptly at 6.30 p.m., so please refrain from leaving early. Now, Larry Young is the President and Chief Executive Officer for Dr. Pepper Snapple Group, one of the world's leading beverage companies. Larry was named President and Chief Executive Officer in October 2007 after serving as President and Chief Operating Officer for the company's Bottling Group Division and led the spinoff of Dr. Pepper Snapple Group from Cadbury Schweppes PLC in May 2008. Larry joined the company in April 2006 through its full acquisition of Dr. Pepper's 7-Up Bottling Group, where he had been president and CEO since 2005. As head of operations, he played a central role in helping to create a new business model for a fully integrated beverage company. By integrating the bottling group and several other independent bottling businesses into DPS, the company now has a more reliable, sustainable, and secure route to market. This has allowed the company to protect its brand equity and improve customer relations through better control of its products from innovation to the store shelf. As a result, DPS can more effectively deliver those brands with direct access to more than 230 million consumers in 34 states. In his 30-year career, Larry has produced and sold virtually every type of beverage in the Americas and across Europe and Russia. He previously served more than 25 years in the Pepsi system, most recently with Pepsi Americas, and before that with PepsiCo General Bottlers, where he began on a, a root truck and worked his way to President and Chief Operating Officer. In 2008, Larry was appointed Chairman of the Board of the American Beverage Association and inducted into the Beverage World Soft Drink Hall of Fame. He and his wife, Colette, live in Dallas and are both natives of Springfield, Missouri. Now please join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Young. Larry, thank you very much for coming down. On behalf of the Macomb School of Business, we appreciate your time. We appreciate the partnership we have with Dr. Pepper Snapple. Thank you for having us here. We're very, very excited about being here tonight. I also know that uh, both you and your wife from Missouri. Missouri's been beating up on Texas uh, teams in recent years. Um, but having lived in Dallas for a fair amount of time and selling the perhaps the quintessential te Texas beverage, uh, I suspect you have some mixed emotions about that. I, whenever Texas plays Missouri, I don't lose either way. It's a win-win <laughs> it, for me. But I do truly root for, I'm, I'm a hook em horns down here, let me tell you. <laughs> okay, I want you to think back uh, to 1969, or maybe even before that. You probably did something before you started in the beverage business. But you know, what was your first job? Tell me about that, and how did you get that, and what'd you, how did it make do what, how did it produce what we have today here sitting beside us? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I was born and raised on a farm. We ran uh, beef cattle, fed cattle out. So, you know, I was the oldest child. I always accused my father of, uh, he forgot I was the oldest. He thought I was a free hired hand. Uh, so I, I can't remember not working. And uh, I was at the stockyards one day. We had taken a load of cattle in, and we were there very early in the morning. Across the street was a Pepsi plant. And I saw a bunch of guys standing outside the, the fence. And as the trucks would come out, they, these guys would jump in the truck. I was always very inquisitive. So I head over to find out what it is. And they would hire them as helpers and pay them by the day. And when I found out what they paid, it was only pennies a case. But it was a lot more than what my dad paid me. And a case back then, everything was returnable. 32 ounce returnable. We had a wooden crate, heavy glass. A case of Pepsi weighed 73 pounds. A bale of hay weighed 100. I thought, this is, I'm moving up in the world right here. So, <laughs> so started as a helper on a truck. Uh, I was telling Lamar earlier, I fell in love with it. Uh, you know, I developed a passion for it. It was like a sport. You went out every day to win. Uh, the Cola Wars are real when you hear about them. The three of us fight like you would not believe every day. So it's just in my blood. If you cut me right now, I'm carbonated. <laughs> Um, Larry, as you were um, growing up through your business world, what, what do you think set you apart from your peers to allow you to succeed? I think one was the, the work ethic that my uh, father gave me. Uh, I was 
you know, whenever, before we got on the farm, my dad was in the Strategic Air Command, so I was born in the Air Force. Uh, had a lot of structure, a lot of discipline, uh, which was really good for how I, you know, kind of started my life. Uh, you know, you did everything to be the best. Uh, I can remember my dad telling me that if you're the street cleaner, make sure you're the best street cleaner out there. And if you're the best street cleaner out there, the other street cleaners will work for you. And he was one of those guys that just believed that if you kept doing it that way, someday you might own the company that, you know, did the street cleaning. So I took that with me and, uh, you know, I was just always looked at everything and said, I'm not going to, when I'd get promoted, I want to look at the next position immediately. And what do I have to do to get there? I wanted to talk to people that had been there. I wanted to surround myself with successful people. And I also realized that I had to build a team under me that when I was ready to go, anybody on that team could take my position. And that's how you really get attention in the business world. Great, great advice. Thinking about your, either your personal life and or your business life, think about somebody you really admire and tell us why. I would uh, I'd kind of have to break that down to three people and uh, that, that's really had an effect on me. Number one was my father. Uh, unbelievable work ethic. Uh, the structure and discipline got me started the right way. Number two would be Don Kendall, uh, who was chairman and co-founder of PepsiCo. Uh, Don bought Frito-Lay back uh, several years ago and everybody thought he was crazy buying a chip company. Uh, he didn't listen to the naysayers and I think it paid off for him pretty good. <laughs> uh, Frito-Lay's doing more than what the Pepsi side of the business has done, but Don always taught me don't ever listen to the naysayers. You know, you gotta stay away from them. There's more negative out there than there's positive and state of the positive. And then the last one is Foots Clements, you know, the chairman of Dr. Pepper. Uh, being a Pepsi bottler, I was very fortunate that I sold a lot of Dr. Pepper while I was a Pepsi bottler, spent a lot of time with Foots. Foots and Don Kendall both were like me. They started on a truck, they worked their way up from the bottom, but Foots really understood his customer. And every person he met, he gave them a marble. And he'd look on the marble and it had the golden rule. And he meant it. And people loved him. And there was not a day, anytime he met you, he thanked you for your Dr. Pepper business. And those three gentlemen just really stood out in my life. Terrific. Is there something yet over your long career that you haven't mastered yet that you'd like to master? Well, I'd love to be able to beat my wife at golf. I'm able to do that. No, I think, uh, you know, I've been very blessed, very fortunate in my career. Uh, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, where I can take this. I just keep going and want to take it to the next level. Uh, one of the things we say in our company, you know, our mission statement is to be the best beverage company in the Americas. We'll never be the biggest. We'll never be like you know, Coke and Pepsi, they have lots of international opportunity to grow the top line, but we can be the best. And I've had some investors the other day say, well, how do you measure, how do you know when you've become the best? And I said, that's when everybody at my competitors want to come and go to work for us. So that's, that's when I'll look at it and say, I've made it where I want it to be. Have you, um have you ever made a mistake in your career? Oh, not <laughs> which, enough. Which one would you like to tell us about? No, there's not enough, <laughs> not enough room in this, on this campus for those. But, uh, you know, before I answer that, I will tell you guys this. Don't be afraid to make a mistake. Learn from them. Just don't make the same one twice because I've made them. I think the, the biggest one I ever made, and, uh, you know, my chief marketing officer is sitting over here, and he, he could, he'll relate to this because... I have this tendency to think I'm in marketing and know what the consumer wants, and I'm usually wrong. But uh, back in the early 90s, when I was in Eastern Europe, a small company came to me and wanted me to distribute their product. I uh, could have had a global contract. And I tasted it, and I thought it tasted like it was terrible. I thought, this will never last. Well, that product was Red Bull. That's the biggest mistake I ever made. <laughs> <laughs> what 
What did you learn from that mistake? <laughs> that I am not the target audience. <laughs> he tells me that every morning. <laughs> That's great. Okay, what do you think? What, what do you, what's your greatest personal accomplishment? What are you probably most proud of? My family. Yeah, I've got a, I have three daughters, five granddaughters, one grandson. You can imagine he's not worth killing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, family, uh, you know, it's very important to me. Uh, you know, my faith. So I think family and faith kind of go together. You got to believe in something. Yeah, I don't care what it is, but believe in it and, you know, stay behind it. Uh, so I'm proud of that. Uh, what I've been able to give back, uh, always give back. You know, you get to a point where, you know, you're only going to spend so much. And give that back and see what you can do to help others. And uh, I really enjoy doing that. My wife really enjoys doing it. So she's good at it. Okay, switching gears just a little bit about, talk about Dr. Pepper Snapple. Um, while you've been CEO, what, what's your company done differently than your competitors to set itself apart? Mm -hmm. Yeah, since we went public, you know, we were, we were part of a, a large corporation, uh, Cadbury Swepps, which was primarily a confectionery company. Um, when we went public, I mean, it was basically on the street in the U.S. that we were the best kept secret in the beverage industry because all Cadbury talked about was chocolates and biscuits and crackers and things like that. So when we went uh, on our own, you know, we looked at it and said what I'd mentioned a moment ago, we'll never be the biggest. We won't be like Coke and Pepsi. So we have to have a strategy that we're going to follow and not deviate from. And we came up with our mission statement to be the best beverage company in America's. I'm very proud to say that when that strategy was put together in 07, we've not deviated from it. It's on one page. Every employee in the company can tell you what it is. It's on the back of salesmen and merchandisers' handhelds. Uh, we believe in it, uh, we stay with it, and uh, our shareholders really enjoy it because we're not the biggest, but we, tell people what we're going to do and we do it. We generate a lot of cash and we give it back to shareholders and we have from the beginning. And uh, so that kind of differentiates us. And I think the other piece of it is sometimes it's good to be small and being small we can move much quicker. There's no hierarchy. Uh, my team all get along. The farthest one from my office is 50 yards. We can have meetings very quickly, make decisions, and act quickly. And you know, if you kind of follow some of the press on us out on the street, we're known for that, that our innovation, we can, we can innovate products in a third of the time of some of the larger companies. What are some of the key elements of the strategy to, to be the best beverage business in the Americas? No, not tactics, but strategy. Right, right. I mean, number one was, you know, that we were going to build and enhance our leading brands. Uh, people look at Dr. Pepper Snapple and they think Dr. Pepper. In Texas, it's Dr. Pepper. In the Northeast and West Coast, it's Snapple. But we have 58 brands. I mean, if you're not drinking a Coke, a Pepsi, a Mountain Dew, or a Sprite, you're probably drinking one of our brands. I mean, we have uh, all the flavors out there. Mott's apple juice. We're number one in uh, mixers uh, with Mr. and Mrs. T's, Margaritaville, uh, Rose's cocktail infusions. Uh, we have applesauce, Mott's apple juice. I mean, we're a very broad portfolio out there. So, you know, when you look at that, you have to say, all right, to build and enhance those brands does not, does not just necessarily, necessarily mean marketing. To build and enhance them, you better have your product at the right place at the right time. And so the first part of our strategy, I started with supply chain and said, all right, where are we going to make it? How are we going to get it there at the lowest possible cost with the highest possible quality at the right place at the right time? You guys can sell and market it all they want, but you better be able to get it there. So we started there. We went into sales. We went into, into the structure of the company. The people made sure we had the right people and uh, the last thing we really did 
was marketing. We had to get everything else right first and then market like a madman. But you can't market if your product's not there. Your marketing's good, so you're going to drive them into the account and they're going to buy something else if you're not there. You have to have top of mind marketing, close at hand retail execution. That product has to be there when they walk in. People are not going to buy your product at the supermarket if they cannot buy it at work, at play, or while they're dining. So that's where we went after it to build and enhance those brands, not just marketing. Got it. How have you seen the beverage industry evolve over your career? What's the biggest changes that you've seen? Oh, my lands, you can imagine. Uh, well, like I said, when I started, everything was returnables. Uh, if you were going to be a, a route salesman for one of the soft drink companies, you had to be a, a very good money manager because all the product was sold between Memorial Day and Labor Day. I mean, like 60 plus 70 percent of your total cases were sold in those summer months. So you could make a lot of money, but you had to be able to manage it. Well, as the consolidation of the retail trade started and Walmarts and all these you know, big chains started coming up, it became necessary for the soft drink companies to start consolidating. When I started, there were probably more bottlers in the four state area I was in than total in the United States today. So that's changed a lot. Uh, we've went into more convenient packages. Uh, you have to have innovation, not only product innovation, but you got to have that package innovation. People like to see things that are different, that are more convenient for them. So you just, you know, we used to laugh in the old days and say, this isn't rocket science. Don't overthink it. We put sweet water in pretty bottles. It's rocket science today. I mean, these sweeteners we come up with, the things we do to have an edge. You know, Dr. Pepper 10 has got a proprietary sweetener in it that we've just launched. Uh, you know, you're out there constantly trying to figure out how to be just a little bit better. Something people are looking for, understand consumer insights, and uh, we're pretty good at it. We do a good job. Given the change over the, 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 your career, um, how do you, what role do you see corporate social responsibility playing today? Uh, it's one of my, it's one of the hot buttons for me. Uh, whenever I came in, we didn't have even a department for it. And one of the first roles I put in was a uh, exec VP of corporate affairs, which under that falls our CSR, corporate social responsibility. I'm very fortunate to have been around the number of years I have because I watched how the old franchises were developed and how the small bottler got very involved in his community and was one of the biggest people in the community. He supported the school. He supported everything that was there. And the guy that did the best job in that community was usually the share leader. And you can see that across the United States. I can take you from the Dakotas to Alabama to Washington State to uh, the Carolinas. The guy that was involved and gave back to his community, that was concerned about his community, you know, socially, the environment, that he was a part of it was the winner. And so we not only do it as a large corporation with the umbrella, but we make sure that each one of our 168 locations, our 24 manufacturing facilities, are a part of their community, a part of that society, and that we're doing the right things that help us to become the best beverage company in the Americas even quicker. Is there a, is there a certain skill set to be CEO of Dr. Pepper Snapple Group? And what is that? I think with Dr. Pepper Snapple, you have to You've got to be able to make decisions very quickly. You've got to be able to beat the other guys in the street. The only way you're going to do that is make sure you have the right people, you know, working for you, working with you. Um, we don't have a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, you know, when I, whenever we went out publicly traded, we bought our bottling operations, uh, the street thought that we were crazy. Uh, I mean, we got our brains beat out for uh, almost four years for buying our bottlers and integrating the business. Uh, four years later, Pepsi come out and did theirs. 
and within nine months, Coke bought theirs. So all of a sudden, the idiots looked pretty smart because we took a chance. We didn't look at it and say, this is the way it is. We looked at it and said, how should it be? And so by leading the way, I think he had, you know, Dr. Pepper Snapple, being small, you got to be a trailblazer. You got to take risk. Uh, you know, there's an old saying in Russia that if you don't take risk, you will not drink Cristal. And they're, they're, they're correct. They're <clears throat> correct. So the other two guys followed us and, uh, you know, made us look a lot better. And now that they bought their bottlers, they were going to sell my product. So I collected $1.8 billion from them for the pleasure of doing that for the four <laughs> years I got beat up. What, what role did, uh, in making that decision, did a deep financial analysis and ROI projection have to play versus 30 plus years of beverage experience in being able to see what needed to be done? Uh, well, it's very much a combination of the two. Uh, you know, the old saying was, you know, always go with the gutometer. And uh, it's right most of the time, but it sure makes you feel a lot better when you have people that can give you the data and you have the facts and knowing that, you know, you're not going to have the regrets. You make those, I say don't be afraid to make you know, mistakes. When they get to the decisions that size, mistakes can cripple you. Mm -hmm. So you want all the data you can get. You want all the information. You want all the analysis done, all the what ifs, and then have the courage after you make your decision to run with it. Be ready for plan A and plan B, because it's not always plan A. Great. What's the best piece of advice you were ever given, career-wise or otherwise? I'd say the best piece of advice was, again, probably coming from my my father, and uh, you know, it was when he told me the importance of being balanced. You know, there's there's quite a bit to it's it's very it's it's great to be successful in your career and everything, but you got to balance that career, you got to balance your family, you got to balance the spirituality and everything, and because if not, I mean, a lot of people in in these businesses and these roles will burn out. You've got to have that balance to where you really feel like, you know, you're full. Uh, the thing he told me that will never leave my mind when he was giving me this, you know, this talk, was my dad was one of those guys that, you know, 17, see you, you're on your own. And uh, he told me, keep my head above the ground clutter. And I said, what's that? In the Air Force, in pilots, well, I'll tell you that the toughest part is till you get above the ground clutter. And then when you get up and in, up into the, the free air and the space, you can do what you want. But do not let the ground clutter get you. Keep going and get above the ground clutter. Keep your head about you until you get above it. When you're evaluating the managers in your organization, what makes a person stand out to you? I think the biggest thing I watch for is just people that have, you can tell when you sit down and talk to them, they have a burning desire to succeed. They have a passion for what they're doing. And they ask, I mean, the right questions. Uh, Lamar and I were talking earlier. I think one of my successes is I manage by walking around. And I'm a very good listener. I don't talk a lot. But if you listen, you really learn a lot. And you can find real quickly the people that are going to take you and your company to the next level. What surprises you about your job today? And what would you change about your job today? I think the, you know, the surprise, it's not a surprise because I've done it a long time, but, you know, being publicly traded makes things very different than just running a business. Uh, I've got a, a lot of great talent that runs a business, and I have to spend a, an awful lot of time with investors and with analysts and uh, the media that are always trying to second guess you. They're trying to build their own models on what you're doing instead of listening to what you tell them. Uh, if I could change anything, I think that would be the biggest piece. Uh, like I said, I've, I've run publicly traded companies a long time, but it, it adds a lot of 
a lot of time and you know that would be much better spent focused on the business than trying to get people to understand what you're doing. One last uh, question for you. It really is a comment to the students. You've got a lot of very smart, bright young people sitting out here. If you could give them one piece of advice, what would it be? Number one is, you know, as you come out of here and you start going to look for, you know, your career, what you want to do, do something you have a passion for. Don't just go look for the job. I mean, have a passion. Do something you love. People will see it. It'll make it fun. You'll be like me. You'll be able to learn something every day and laugh every day. But it makes all the difference in the world. That would be my advice. Hello. Oh. Hi, uh, Mr. Young. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ed Zhang. I'm a sophomore finance major. Uh, my question for you tonight is, um, you mentioned about your CSR focus. Um, could you elaborate a little more whether it's on, you know, do you have a focus on sustainability, supply chain responsibility, community development, or talk a little bit more about that? All the above. All the above? All the above, yeah. No, if you, and I think, you know, I'll explain a little bit of it here for you, but if you go on our website, I think it's one, we've really done a great job on how we lay it out. Uh, it's very much in the sustainability, the environment, our, our supply chain. I mean, we just opened up our last uh, uh, manufacturing facility in our uh, supply chain strategy that is uh, LEED certified. Um, we just had our facility in Dallas uh, certified. Uh, we spend a tremendous amount of time on that piece of it. Uh, then we break out and go to another piece where, you know, so much on giving back, you know, what we do with the uh, charitable organizations, what we believe in, what we stand behind. And another big piece is our employees. I mean, you know, for our employees understanding what we do, what we stand for, and that we're just not out there to, you know, make money and pay a dividend. Thank you. But we are out there to make money and pay a dividend. <laughs> <laughs> In case you're buying any stock. <laughs> yes, I can uh, hear you. Okay. So first off, thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank uh, you. my name is Anthony Chin. I am a finance, or I'm going into finance. I'm a freshman here at the Macomb School of Business. So my question for you is: When you were in your late teens or early 20s, what sort of dreams or ambitions did you have, and how did they pan out? And also, how do they compare to where you are today? In my teens, what kind of dreams? I, I can tell you this. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've, you know, a true dream. I don't think I've ever had one. I sleep that sound. My wife says I have them. I just don't remember them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I, was, uh, when I was young, I mean, we didn't, uh, we didn't have a lot. And... Uh, you know, I think life is really great as you're growing up until you go to school. Because until you go to school, you think everything's equal. And you think everybody lives the same. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing differences. And I don't know, I, I, I wanted a lot of things. I just, I always wanted. I was never satisfied where I was, either in a position or what I had. And, uh, you know, it, I looked at it as it was always winning. I, I loved to win. I was, uh, when I was young, I boxed. And uh, believe me, you want to win boxing because it hurts to lose. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, it just, it always kind of drove me. And I, I, I think I'm really still fighting today. I think I'm in about the, I'm probably in the seventh round of a 12-round championship match. So did you ever like visualize when you were young to be like the CEO of Dr. Pepper Snapple Group? No, each step I just looked at the next one. I never really uh, went out that far. I'll uh, tell you a funny story. A guy asked me the other day, he said, if your dad was around, he said, uh, I bet he'd be proud of you. And I said, nah. I said, he'd look at you and say only the good Lord could do so much with so little. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. How are you doing, Mr. Young? Uh, really appreciate all the insight so far. My name is Skylar Talley. I'm a junior finance major here. Um, you spoke a while ago about Dr. Pepper 10 really briefly. Um, it's a product that I really like. I think it's a unique product. Can you sp kind of speak to the evolution, how it came about, how, why y'all developed it, stuff like that? Yeah, I think uh, 
you know, it's and Jim, help you correct me if I get this wrong, because I'm I'm going to put my marketing hat on here, and that scares him to death. <laughs> but uh, you know, I was uh, chairman of the American uh, Beverage Association, and what we do there is, it's the entire industry where we come together and take our hats off and and our, take our badges off and say we're going to do what's right for the industry. We had to fight taxes. We had to see what was right for obesity. Uh, you know, making sure we had the right messages out there, the right marketing, that we weren't marketing to children, that we were putting the right things in the school systems. Uh, again, part of our CSR, a big piece of that. But uh, as we kept looking at it, you know, we, we go by what the consumer wants. We really study our consumer insights. And Jim takes those consumer insights and he, you know, he takes those to R&D and says, here's something we need. Well, one was the caloric intake, people wanting better for you. Now, they say they want better for you, but fried chicken sales are higher than they've ever been in history because we fry the chicken now and put it on top of a salad. And you eat the chicken and leave the salad and tell everybody you're on a good <laughs> diet. So we had to weigh that out and say how much of that is there. So we also looked at it and said that a lot of heavy Dr. Pepper users, a lot of guys, not just Dr. Pepper, but heavy sugar beverage drinkers, did, men did not want to have a diet. They just weren't going to do it. So we looked at it and said, this is a great opportunity for us to get in there, find something that will kind of, you know, be like a trifecta almost for us on what we wanted to accomplish. And the R&D team come up with this product that I taste like Dr. Pepper with imperial sugar. It's got the great mouthfeel because diets, no matter, even if they taste just like the regular, they're lighter in your mouth. And... Uh, you know, it was just an absolute home run. And then the marketing campaign that Jim came up with on it, I mean, we're having a lot of fun with it. I mean, you know, he gets pictures sent to him of, you know, female shoppers that have put mustaches and, and beards on saying, you can't keep me from buying it. So, you know, just for men, is it's fun. It's tongue-in-cheek, but uh, it's a great product, and uh, we're very excited about what it's doing. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Young. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Kayla Messmore, and I'm a sophomore engineering out to business major. Um, I just had a question. When you filed for the Dr. Pepper 10, you also submitted some other low-calorie drinks. I was just reading about it the other day. Uh huh. Um, and I was wondering how you were planning to implement those in A&W or 7-Up and stuff like that. Yeah, you're correct. What we did, I mean, we, you know, whenever you come up with something like that, we wanted to make sure it was a platform and we wanted to uh, make sure we protect the, uh, the rights and the trademark and everything to that. Uh, the, the sweetener's proprietary, but we know we can use it in others. Um, we can, we can take it across our other brands. There's really, there's no plans out there right now. Uh, we wanna make sure that we do Dr. Dr. Pepper 10 correctly. And um, as we see that it's doing, meeting the hurdles that Jim and his team have set, like I mentioned a moment ago, we can move quickly and have other items out there ready to go. So stay tuned. Hi, Mr. Young. My name is uh, Jeff Stevens. I'm a third year finance major here at McCombs. Uh, my question, and you spoke to this a little bit earlier, but uh, I, it was news to me that you know the Moth Applesauce brands, among others, does belong to the Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. What's the rationale behind being a, a house of brands rather than a branded house, and how does that help you all succeed? <laughs> Well, a lot of it, uh, you know, we basically started off with playing the cards we were dealt. You know, Cadbury was, had a crew of people that were very good at buying and selling companies, uh, never really running one. Uh, you know, Snapple as an example. You know, they, Snapple is uh, one of the best business school studies you can never look at. I mean, you know, two guys go out and make a fortune with an apple carbonated soft drink, then go into a tea. They get uh, T.H. Lee to put some money in, and then they sell it to Quaker for $1.3 billion. Quaker totally destroyed it. Uh, they're about to, you know, it just didn't work. And a, another private equity firm bought it for $300 million. Then that private equity firm sold it to Cadbury for $1.4 billion. And then Cadbury didn't do anything with it for 10 years until Jim and I come in. The last thing Cadbury gave us was our name, Dr. Pepper Snapple. 
I'll be honest with you, I would have never, ever named the company Dr. Pepper Snapple. It'd have been Dr. Pepper or Dr. Pepper 7-Up. I mean, that's what the world knew uh, for years. But if Snapple's gonna be in our name, it was going, we were gonna fix it. And we got the teams together and we did. So as we kept looking at it, I mean, we said, you know, we've got the brands, but we gotta have a strategy. We can't spend on 58. Cadbury did, there were 58 brand managers and everybody had a little budget, but nobody had enough money to do anything. So Jim and his team put a strategy together that we're gonna have 15 powerhouse brands. I think it's 14 right now, so he's got a little money he's got hid. But uh, that's what we're gonna spend on. That's where we're gonna go and build. And then those other brands, you have some that you, know, you can harvest and you have some that are regional. Uh, you know, if you look down here in this area, Big Red, we own part of Big Red, not all of it, but Big Red is very strong here in South Texas. Uh, you can't give it away in Southern California. Um, Michigan, Verner's Ginger Ale. You'll walk in and they'll have a full four to six foot section of Verner's Ginger Ale. I don't know if it's even, is it even sold in Texas? A little bit down here? But I mean, it's just, so you have regional brands that'll make money. So we looked at it and said, we're gonna manage it like a portfolio. We're gonna invest in these brands, we're gonna harvest these brands, we're gonna do regional. And then we'll study the brands. If you watch what we've done in the last three years, we come up with a crush that was a regional brand, had 40% uh, ACV. Uh, we put it in the Pepsi system, they needed a flavor, and uh, basically tripled the size of that brand, made it a national brand. Came right behind that and came up with one called Sundrop from the Southeast that Coke bottlers use in the Southeast to compete against Mountain Dew. Actually outsold Mountain Dew in some markets. So Jim and his team again put a, a marketing plan together. We did one of the first in the history of contracting with MTV. MTV does every bit of the marketing on, uh, on Sundrop. We just distribute it. And so it's like a partnership there. So it's, you take your 15 brands, focus on them, play with your regionals, and then look at those others and say, how can I make these explode? So in the beginning, everybody thought I should sell a lot of them off. The easiest thing in the world is to sell a brand. It's more fun to try and build them. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mr. Young. Uh, my name is Mark Jabelli, and I'm a freshman in the College of Liberal Arts, studying Plan 2 in government. I'm wondering, in your experience as CEO and rising through Dr. Pepper Snapple, um, how have you built the right team? What do you look for in employees, and what stands out to you? Yeah, I think the biggest thing I, you know, I go after is just you know people that have a can-do attitude. That you know. They focus more on the positive. They focus more on how can we change it. Um, you know, we have a program in our, in our organization that uh, is called Rapid Continuous Improvement. Uh, everybody knows what continuous improvement is. I like everything to be a little faster than everybody else's. But whenever you look at, you know, when you build a team, you want people that want to look at continually improving. You know, not accepting what it is. How should it be? How could it be? What can we do to get it there? Uh, you know, just people that you know without a doubt that you could go to battle with and they'd be right there with you. Uh, you know, in my, my career, I've never ever asked anybody to do something that I haven't done or wouldn't do. And, uh, you know, you just, you got to have those people with you that you just have the confidence that you can go against anything. Um, you know, that team is pretty easy to put together. You can find them. The challenge is what do you get underneath them? How do you get the right people in there to develop the leaders of tomorrow? How do we get people like you guys in the right positions that if one of these guys get hit by a bus, there is no doubt in my mind that I've got the bench strength below them that those positions will be, be covered. Um, that's why I manage by walking around. I find more out by just visiting with people and listening to them and making sure they're in the right positions, that we're giving them the right resources for them to be successful. So I watch much closer that level underneath because once you put your team together, you know, you've, you got it made, but you've got to make sure you've got the, you know, two layers below them very well staffed. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Young. Again, we really appreciate your time that you're taking out to come out here. And my question is that in foreign markets such as Mexico, where the company is trying to open up and there's much room for economic growth, where do you see the company's um, marketing tactics changing um, in comparison to the domestic tactics you use here in the U.S.? 
Yeah, again, I think when you look at international markets, it's, uh, again, we're playing the cards we were dealt. Uh, Cadbury in 1998 sold the global rights to all of our brands to Coke and Pepsi. Uh, so we're very much a North American company, Mexico, U.S., and Canada. Um, our Mexico business, uh, you know, was never really focused on under Cadbury. We've uh, been going three years of investment, a lot of it in, again, I mean, I'm like a broken record sometimes, but supply chain and IT. And, you know, you got to have the right supply chain, you got to have the right systems. And we're starting to see our organization down there really start to take off. Mexico has its challenges. I mean, it's, it's a lot of corruption down there, and the, the economy's pretty weak. But if you go in and do the right things, it'll work. Um, it's only 10% of our business, but I really believe as, you know, it can be one of our growth drivers as we go on down the road. Uh, with not having the international opportunities, that's why we spent so much time on our strategy that we wanted to make sure that we understood where the low per cap markets we had in the United States were so that we could actually treat those like an international assignment. Let's go in, figure out why the people in you know, the Northeast do not drink as much Dr. Pepper as people in Oklahoma. How do we get that per cap from 20 to this, you know, the national average of 64 now? You know, how do we get it to the average of Oklahoma, which is almost 300? So breaking it down, looking at it as an international market, saying these are the investments we need to make here, that's how we're going to drive the 15 years of growth we took. <clears throat> All right, thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Young. My name is Adam Petrus. I'm a freshman here at Macomb School of Business. Um, I just want to ask you a question on a, light, question on a lighter note. Of all the drinks that you supply in the Dr. Pepper Snapple group, which one is your favorite? Oh, I love them all, but I probably drink more Diet RC than anything else. Yeah, second would be a Diet Snapple Green Tea. All right, thank you. Very thank much. you. Hi, Mr. Young. My name is He Alex. can ask more questions. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Alex Hodges. I'm a junior here at the McComb School of Business. My question for you is, having worked for Pepsi earlier on in your career, what has it been like transitioning to Dr. Pepper, and what are some of the challenges and new things you have to learn working for a company that's not as large? Well, it, you know, I'll be real honest with you. The toughest thing in the world, for me, and it, it was, I mean, just, freaked me out for about six months was to not order Diet Pepsi with my lunch. I mean, just imagine doing it that many years. I mean, it just came out, it was just natural to say it. So that was the toughest. Uh, I think, <laughs> I think the beverage business is very much the beverage business. You know, there was, the only real big difference between the two was the actual investments the company had made earlier but it was something that I'd been there, done that, so I knew we could do it, and we did it much quicker. So uh, that, they just hadn't invested properly, and so but we got it done pretty quick. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Young. My name's uh, Ryan Morris. I'm a freshman at McCombs. Um, thank you for your time here today. Um, what were the specific benefits from merging your bot merging the bottling companies, like buying the bottling companies and merging them with your soda companies, and which benefits stood out the most to other companies to persuade them to do the same thing as you all did? Well, again, if you look at, you know, 100 years ago when the bottling operations were set up, franchises were granted uh, basically on how far a horse and wagon could go on a day. And those agreements were granted in perpetuity, so they could never be taken away. And it worked very well for a lot of years, and everybody built the business and was involved in the communities. And then it started to, you know, get to where, you know, the few consolidation, the areas would get larger. Finally, it got down to a point where, you know, Coke had a couple of hundred bottlers, Pepsi had a couple of hundred bottlers, and Dr. Pepper had a couple of hundred bottlers. And the bottler had all of the investment, all the capital, all the rolling stock. So if you looked at a P&L, a bottler operated on very narrow margins. A concentrate company was selling concentrate. They didn't care what size package it was sold in because it was the same price. They had very good margins and they, spent, they did marketing. So there was always an argument over the size of the pie that was being split. Well, that argument got even greater when the industry 
started consolidating, all the retailers, all the national accounts that wanted one voice. So if Pepsi or Coke were out making a call to a Walmart, Walmart would say, this is what we'd like to do. They had to go back and get with all the bottlers to agree with it. So now your retailer's aggravated. Or the bottler would say, I don't make enough money on this. I can't afford to do it. So you had constantly infighting instead of doing what was right for your customer, your consumer, and your brand. So when we brought it all in-house, I think they realized real quick it allowed us to move quicker. We could speak to the retailer with one voice, and we started gaining share. So I think everybody realized real fast that it was time for the industry to start looking at another way to do business. Thank you, sir. Thanks again for coming, Mr. Young. My name is Bargov. I'm a Plan 2 honor student. Uh, and my question for you is kind of two-part. So maybe you can answer the first part, and that might lead you into the second. So the first, you talked about Big Red. You talked about New Grape. I think um, the first question is, were these acquisitions primarily driven by kind of the operational synergies, bottling, or distribution? Or were they driven more by kind of your ability to be the PNG of the of the beverage industry and manage the brand? And then overall, kind of the second part of the question is, in the future, maybe the next decade or two, what's going to be the emphasis for Dr. Pepper Snapple? Is it the brand management side or the operational distribution side? Well, I'll answer the second one first. I'll always be a brand company. That's that's what's important. Uh, number one, build and enhance leading brands. I mean, I've got to have the entire organization staying focused on that because the rest of it, you know, we've we've got to go in and fine tune. But you've got to have that brand and that image out there. Uh, you know, talking about Big Red and uh, New Grip, I don't. We don't actually own them. I own a piece of them. Um, you know, back if, several years ago, uh, there was a little company out here called uh, Vitamin Water, and uh, Vitamin Water, we built it with our distribution, and the young man that owned it, uh, sharp young man that basically never made a penny for ten years. He lived off his TNE and the cash flow. Uh, not making any money. So we built the distribution, we took markets, we took it, uh, you know, crossed our footprint on our DSD system, and uh, he sold that company for $4.2 billion to the Coca-Cola company. And at that time, I looked at it and said, I'll never build another brand for somebody <laughs> with distribution that I don't have an equity stake in it. So we are the automatic place for the new, you know, the incubators of soft drinks to come in and get distribution. But if I distribute your product, I'm gonna get a piece of the pie. <laughs> and when somebody offers you $4.2 billion for it, I'm gonna say, sell it. <laughs> that answer your question? Yeah. All right, sure. good. Thank you. Mr. Young, thank you for being here again. Uh, my name is Eugene Chow. I'm a student at McComb School of Business. Um, earlier you were talking about how you defined success as making Dr. Pepper Snapple, the, Dr. Pepper Snapple, the place where everyone wants to work. And also, you talked about your team and getting it together and having two layers of people who you know are guaranteed be, will be able to step up. What do you think is like the defining culture at Dr. Pepper Snapple? Is it pioneering spirit, innovation? What would you say? Well, I think one that stands out to most of me and the feedback I get from people. When they come into our building, when they're in, you know, in any of our buildings across the United States, uh, and this just makes me very proud. I mean, everybody tells me that my, my team leads by example, and that people watch that and know that, that uh, you know, people want to follow them. I think number two is that, uh, you know, we really truly do strive to, to work hard, be successful, but have fun. I mean, when I tell you I want to laugh every day, learn something and laugh every day, I want you to laugh every day too. And it just, you know, I tell people I don't have a culture because culture makes milk go sour. And I don't need any cottage cheese or yogurt. I want behavior. I'm a behavior guy. I want to see a certain behavior. And that behavior is winners, leaders, learning, having fun. Hi, Mr. Young. Thanks again for coming. My name is Taylor Ragsdale. I'm a junior in the business school. 
I was just wondering if you could talk a little about your work-life balance and how you handle making time for your family, but still running Dr. Pepper Schnapple. Yeah, you know, I think I told, I don't know if I told Lamar this earlier, I told you guys, but my wife's my best friend. And so, you know, you have to have it that way when you have the type of schedule I have that you never know where you're going to be. But, you know, you look at it and you share the calendar and you figure out what times you do have and make those the best. You know, they may not be as many as you want. You know, I've never in my life been a guy that, you know, could kiss her goodbye at 8 and say, I'll see you at supper at 5.30 because, you know, I might be in another country halfway around the world. But uh, it's just making the effort to sit down and communicate, to make sure everybody's on the same page, looking at that calendar saying, these are the things we're going to do. Uh, you know, telling yourself that you're going to do the right things to stay physically fit, you know, the activities, what amount of time you're going to give to it because, you know, it, d it doesn't do anybody any good if you're, you're sick or, you know, you, get, you die or you're in the hospital or something, so make sure you take care of yourself that way. And then, like I said earlier, spiritually, I mean, whatever you believe in, believe in it. You know, get behind it and say, this is part of me. This, these are the, the four squares that I'm going to do. So, you know, it's, I tell you this, it's not simple. It's not easy. But uh, it's like anything worth having. I mean, you got to work at it. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Young. My name is Olivia Luca. I'm a junior here in the business school. And I was just wondering, out of all the different job roles you've had, which has been the most challenging and how you uh, succeeded in that role, even though it was challenging? Well, I would, I would have to say the most challenging is the, the CEO role in uh, a CEO of International and a CEO of the bottling group, CEO of this company. You know, it, it's people say, you know, some people think it's just the same, but I mean, I'm going to tell you what, it is lonely at the top. And, you know, excuse my French, but I had a, a very, very famous leader tell me this one time, a CEO, chairman CEO of a company. It's the only position in the world that shit runs uphill. <laughs> it does. I mean, you know, and he told me that and I laughed just like you guys did. And then when I got my first CEO position, I called him. I said, boy, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, that's why you have to learn and laugh every day. You know, how do you handle those situations? And, uh, you know, where do you go to? You know, who do you go talk to when you just, you know, need to, as a C COO, you know, you can go in and talk to the CEO. And all of a sudden it comes up to you and you're saying, hmm, who am I going to talk to? <laughs> Jim. Yeah, to Jim. <laughs> he closes his door when he sees me coming. So. So I'd say that's the toughest one. Thank you. The greatest one in the world is your first general management job. When you're out in, let's say it's Fargo, you know, North Dakota, and you're, that's your territory. You're Mr. Dr. Pepper in that territory. You're the general manager. It's, it's, a, it's a great life. But you don't stay in that very long. You keep going up if you're good at it. <clears throat> we take it one more question from the audience. Hi, I'm Dia Sika. I'm a senior history major. And my question for you was, how does Dr. Pepper Snapple balance business ethics and the right thing to do with its duty to shareholders to maximize profits? OK, let me sure. How do we balance our ethics? and delivering shareholder return, I, I, to me, they're one. They're one and the same. Uh, you know, we're not going to do anything. I mean, you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do, and the results will be there. I mean, you know, I, I tell our team, we, we do, you know, if you get out there and you have great people and great brands, you're going to deliver great results. And if the results are not great, well, then we're going we're gonna to have to explain them. We're not going to do something different. We're not going to try and fudge it a little bit at all. And, um, you know, we have a tremendous amount of training through our organization. And we have online that people have to take every year an update on, you know, our moral code of conduct and how we operate as a company and what we believe in. And every employee has to do that. And, um, you know, it's, it's just a great check and balance. 
Uh, you, you probably never eliminate all of it, but uh, you, you hope that you get people thinking the right way, that you, know, you do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Everybody join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson and Mr. Young. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I know that we will be able to take your lessons and apply them to our own lives. As a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present Mr. Young with his personalized Stetson cowboy hat in recognition of his participation in the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. Well, you got the right size. There you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.